Hey guys, it's Sophie from Build Your Jungle and today I'm going to be talking all about some very common houseplant pests, how to identify them and how to treat them. And I've lost my tripod, so we're going to have to have this rainbow of light above me right now. I feel like I'm holding a rainbow, Ooh. because I have got my phone lent on a mirror that's doing this and it's all going to get today. So. It is what it is. Kitchen noises. Ah. Before I hop into this, there is going to be some talk of using pesticides. So I just want to give a disclaimer now, instead of doing it whenever I talk about pesticides in this video, please use them responsibly. Read the instructions before you use them. Use them in a ventilated area. I like to treat plants in my bathroom with the extractor fan on, the windows open, gloves on. If you do not have uh, terrible vision, you may want some goggles as well. I already basically have goggles and a face covering. Pesticides can also cause extreme eye irritation and blindness in very extreme cases. So I do recommend investing in one of those very cheap uh, eye wash, emergency eye wash kits and just keeping that in your bathroom or wherever you work with pesticides, just in case. The last little nugget is don't do it outside. Uh, it can harm the beneficial insects and bugs and they're our friends. We don't want to hurt them. Okay, so let's get into the good, the bad and the crawly. Mealybugs, in my opinion, are I don't want to say my favourite pest to have, but they are because it's quite easy to get rid of them, especially if you catch them early. They have a very distinctive armoured look to them. The females look like this and they have lots of little, probably not legs, but it looks like a lot of lots of legs around them. This is now the mealybug dance. Their egg sacs are covered in a white fuzz, so it can often look like someone's chucked a load of cotton wool balls onto your plant. Not literally balls, but cotton wool onto your plant or just hot glue gunned it on there. And that is how you will often first notice mealybug infestations. When mealybugs feed on plants, they basically excrete a substance that's called honeydew. And this is very sticky and that encourages the growth of sooty molds. These annoying little buggers tend to hide right in the nooks and crannies, right in the gaps between petioles and stems and all the places that they think we're not smart enough to look. So you need to take a really close hard look when you're looking for them guys. Now, this is something that I didn't realize at first, but the male, but the male mealybugs look completely different to the females. Here's a female, here's a male. Now, these guys kind of look like fungus gnats, but the way to tell them apart, I'm gonna pop up a fungus gnat on the screen now. I've actually probably got one or two flying around me as I speak. The mealybugs look fuzzier and they have these two prongs that are white that come out of their bum. These ladies can lay a lot of eggs very, very quickly. So it's much easier to just nip it in the bud and treat it quickly. But honestly, all those guys are gonna do is mate with these so that they can make more. So these guys, you know, not a big deal because on their own, if you eliminate the females, what are they gonna do, honestly? So the best way to get rid of them is with isopropyl alcohol. This is some branded one called isopropanol. I've honestly had this for two years and it's half full. And what you wanna do basically is use a cotton bud or a cotton swab and hold it over the mealybug and it will dehydrate it. And then it's just very easy just to remove them. Some people like to dilute this and spray it on leaves, but I don't recommend that because it can damage plants. It's much easier just to directly treat the mealybugs and then isolate the plants and then watch for a return second generation. It can be really hard to identify aphids because there are like so many species of them, like literally a ridiculous amount. I don't even know how many, this many. Aphids really thrive in the UK, so it's very easy for them to be brought inside by accident. This year I had orange, 
grey and green aphids all on one plant fighting for dominance. It was weird. It was really weird. Some of the aphids were eating other aphids. It was weird. There are many different colours and sizes of them and some are wingless and some have little wings. Their body shape is kind of pear shape. It comes to this point and then they've got these two prongs out of there. I'm going to say butt again, which I think is called a cornicle and that is how you can tell it's an aphid. Now the good news is straight up these guys are really easy to squish. But the bad news is that I have seen these devastate collections. So they can do a lot of damage very, very quickly. But the second good news is at least it's easier to spot than thrips. Because if you come into this video and you've got aphids right now, you could have had thrips. With aphids, it's common to see a lot of these aphid ghosts, which are basically the shedded skins of the aphids that they leave behind on the leaves. And these are often mistaken for white fly. When it comes to getting rid of them, I think the main problem that people face is resistance to pesticides and I've experienced that myself. The first line of defense should always be just blasting the plants with water just to knock as many of the adults off as you can. You can then go and manually squish them because they squish very easily uh, and then you'll want to treat with a pesticide. Now I would wait for the water to have dried off the leaves so that it's not diluting the pesticide further and then use something like either Provanto or SB invigorator are my two main recommendations. Provanto is an actual insecticide and it's toxic so you're going to want to make sure that the air is super well ventilated for both of these anyway like I said at the beginning of the video but also if you're doing it in your bath like I do like really wash that area down after you've finished using it and SP invigorator works more similarly to something natural like neem oil because it works by physically suffocating the pests. And really with aphids, it's just gonna have to be about stubbornness and repeating this. You're gonna have to look at the individual instructions on the pesticides as to how often you need to repeat something. For example, when I last used Provanto for a bad thrip infestation, I believe I did the second application after three days and then an additional one after seven further days. And I would always recommend getting the concentrate versions of these products because it's so much better value for money, but just make sure that you're careful when you're mixing it up and that you're not mixing up the wrong ratios and that you're following the guidelines. I think some people really have it out for spider mites, but I'm not one of those people because honestly, again, it could be thrips. The good thing about spider mites is they generally stick to the plants in the immediate area where they are. Usually they don't spread to plants that aren't directly touching them or right next to them. So that's that's good at least. They look like this because they're mites. They're technically like arachnids. So these require a different type of treatment, but we'll talk about that in a minute. You will usually end up spotting damage or webbing first. So the damage to the leaves looks like this and it's like a speck called yellowing fungus now. But as it progresses, areas of the leaf can start to die off and get little brown bits in that as well. Again, they're sap sucking, which is why it's speckly like that, because it's all the little mouth puncture marks from in there. But the webbing is usually all underneath. And I've a lot of times I've seen a web on my plant and I've panicked, but it's just been a spider. So honestly, if your plant's fine and there's just some web, just, just check, have a quick spider check first and then if you find the spider it's just like instant you go no further because it's just the spider. I think people don't realize that when you've got plants you actually end up with a lot of little pet spiders just around the plants because honestly they really keep the fungus gnats in check and we all know about Steve who lives in the jade plant and the living room is a good guy but if there's no spider then you want to look closer with one of these into the webbing because you usually find little clusters of spider mites hiding in there and under the leaves during the day. How do we get rid of spider mites? Well, again, the first thing would be to just blast them away, just shower head them away. 
off the plan. Also, a lot of people like to wipe down the leaves and then be sterilizing the cloth in between because sometimes they're really stubborn little shits and they're just really on there. The best mitre side that I've used is SMC, I think it's called SMC Spider Mite Killer. Again, the concentrate one is better. So you can then, when the plant's dried off, you can either use this on it or SB Invigorator also works because of the suffocating motion. It, it annihilates them. If you've not got a big collection or you have space where you can completely isolate these plants that are affected on their own, you could use neem oil. The first problem is it takes 48 hours to work, so it's not immediate, which is a bit inconvenient. And the second thing is the smell. Like, I don't know if anyone else agrees with me, but the smell of neem oil is horrific and it just stays, it stays on the plants. And if you get it in the soil, the whole pot just stinks of it. And I'm just thinking of my hypersensitive bitches out there because I really, really, that strong smells really, really bother me and it's a terrible smell. I don't like neem oil. It's also not practical to me, for me to use because of what I covered in reason one why I don't like it. But if you prefer to be more natural, that is an option. And again, you'll want to repeat treatment until it's under control. But with neem oil, be careful because, because it's literally like an oil, you can just be suffocating the plant itself if you're covering it with too much, especially if you're mixing up your own. Just like to take a minute to say, you have my deepest condolences. The roots are just the worst, the worst. Oh, if you've never had thrips, oh, you are one lucky duck, one lucky duck. They're absolute little shits, the destroyer of worlds, leeches of happiness. You do not want to encounter these, but sometimes if you live in a place where there are lots of thrips, it's just inevitable. And they often come home with us from garden centres and stuff. And I mean, when I just go out to walk the dog or whatever, I see thrips just covering all the weed flowers, like flowers of weeds that are just on the side of the road. They're just really attracted to fresh flowers and fresh growth. And I literally saw hundreds of them on just one flower the other day. So it, it always reoccurs at some point. I get it at least once a year, I get thrips, even if I don't bring new plants in. And I remember thrips were the first pest I ever had other than fungus gnats. And I was so cocky until that point. I was like, why are all these people talking about how bad it is to have thrips? Like, I've not even had any pests yet. Maybe I won't even get any pests. I was foolish, young and naive. To start with, they are so tiny that you probably won't even spot them until it's super, super advanced. Every single time I always spot the actual damage to the plant first, which is so irritating. The bloody semi-transparent, so they've basically got powers of invisibility, which doesn't help obviously. There are a lot of different species of them, but the ones that we tend to get in glass houses and on the house plants are banded palm thrips. The larva and the nymphs are so tiny that you probably wouldn't even be able to see most people without a magnifying glass, but the adults, even full size, they're like one to two millimeters. The way that this looks totally different to spider mites is that you will notice either a complete lack of pigment, like areas of the leaves have become transparent or silvery. You'll also often see a lot of black specks on the top of the leaves, and that's the thrips pill that they left as a lovely little present. A while ago I made an illustration about the life cycle thrips, so I'm just going to stick that up there while I talk about it. As you can see, if you've spotted an adult, unless you have literally spotted the OG thrip in this infestation, it's been going on for quite a while, so what you need to think about when you treat them is, I'm so sorry, but it's going to at least go on for two generations, so you've got to be repetitive with this treatment. Now, there are times when I've tried to be lazy and I've tried to skip these steps and I've tried to just straight on spray things and be like, I don't have time for this. That just made more plants be susceptible as the thing carries on because I hadn't fully 
done my routine. So I'm gonna share with you guys my ultimate thrip eradication routine that I do whenever this happens. This is actually pretty triggering for me right now because I had to go through this recently. Even if you don't find anything on the plants, just presume that anything surrounding patient zero has at least got small thrips or larvae or eggs in the soil. And yes, this is a lot more effort, but it's worth it because if you kill the eggs and the stuff now, like before all the other plants get damaged, because these really do some serious damage to plants, especially new leaves. Sometimes as well, the leaves after you've had drips on a plant will come out all deformed. So first I take all of the plants and I spray them down in my shower really well at all different angles. Then I take 3% hydrogen peroxide solution and wearing gloves, I mix that up with five parts water, one part 3% hydrogen peroxide, and I use that solution to water all of my plants. Make sure as well that you're mixing it up properly so it's not just all settled at the bottom and then one plant's gonna get like a mega rush of hydrogen peroxide. Also, don't be alarmed because it fizzes when it hits the soil and when it's going through the plant. It's really good for the plant's root system actually and it also helps oxygenate the roots. And why we're doing that is because the hydrogen peroxide will help to dehydrate and kill off any eggs that have not hatched and potentially larva as well. Then I leave the plants to dry because I don't want the wetness on the leaves to be watering down my pesticide. I mix up my pesticide solution. This time I've been using SB Invigorator. Or again, if you really, really want to be natural, you can use neem oil. I can see why some people would opt to use neem oil for spider mites, but the thrips, like it spreads so quickly, they move a lot faster than spider mites. Also, the fully grown, blossomed, evolved, when they've evolved into their final form, they can fly. Not very well, but they can. So it can spread to plants that are just nowhere near. It's so irritating. We can just tell in this whole segment how much I hate the ribs. Alternatively, and this applies for aphids as well also, if you are growing everything in a greenhouse, in a controlled environment, in a closed off environment, you could use biological pest control. You could actually use ladybirds, which can be purchased in sachets as larva, and you just hang them in there with your plants. And obviously you wouldn't want to do that. Well, maybe someone would, but I don't recommend doing that just in your house. I wouldn't want to do that in my, just in my house. I have a bunch of ladybirds flying about everywhere. My dog would probably be really confused. But if you do use biological pest control, be really mindful of using them on plants where you've used pesticide or of applying pesticides and chemicals further and just check that it's safe for that insect. Scale actually covers a wide range of scale insects, but there are kind of two main types. Multiple species could probably fit in what we think of when we say these types, but I'm not an expert, so I don't know. But there's a whitish one and a brownish one that you tend to see in houseplants. Scale insects create a hard shell of wax over themselves to protect themselves while they suck the sap out of your plants. It's pretty clever to be honest because they also do that wax thing that when they're laying their eggs to protect them. And if you've ever had scale, you might know, it's very difficult to get off. I have most commonly seen it on cacti. My housemate brought this cactus home. It was much bigger and I saw immediately that it had quite a bit of scale. I might be able to find a picture. A long time ago, I had a picture of it. The option I took here was the easy way out. But to be honest, it was a last ditch easy way out because I did try and treat it first, but it didn't work. So what I'm saying here is if it's really bad and treatment doesn't work, you can just take a cutting from the plant and start it again and it's most likely be fine because this was like a year ago. It was just this one paddle and it's finally grown another one this summer. There's no scale on this. It's never resurfaced, so that works. But if you love this plant so much and you want to do it the hard way, this is the hard way. So firstly, SB Invigorator does help kill off some of the population, but it's going to be very similar to mealybugs where you're going to be using 
isopropyl alcohol to dehydrate them and try and break down that waxy outer coating with a cotton bud and pry them off. But the thing is, they are so much more stubborn than a mealybug. Mealybugs just pretty much start to, you know, dissolve a bit and then it's fine and you can just get them off. But scale, it just sticks on there. So the problem I found with scale is that even on cacti, which are gonna be some of the hardiest plants to be able to prod without damaging, I just found that it was really difficult to get off. So a lot of times I've ended up damaging a cactus when I'm trying to get that off at least a little bit, because when it's a lot, and you're doing it in a lot of areas, it's just very difficult not to. Similarly to this though, if you are lucky and it's on an uh, area that can be pruned off, you can always prune away uh, the scaled affected areas. And also uh, there's issues where the eggs can drop off into the soil and that can bring a second generation of scales. So again, it's about repetition, which is what I have done in this video. Lastly, I'm going to talk about the little black flies that are flying about a little bit in here. It's fungus snaps, or as we call them in our house, funky snaps, and that's why. A lot of people mistake them for fruit flies, but once you see the difference, it is more obvious in person that fruit flies are a lot bigger. They're also brown and fungus gnats are really small and black. More than being a pest, they're just like a general nuisance you will always have to put up with at some point in your plant parent journey because they just, they just be. Like, um, luckily I've started collecting small spider residents to live in certain pots that have helped with the fungus gnats quite a bit. They breed in the moist topsoil of plants and then you will notice them fly out of there. So the first thing to do is always yellow sticky traps just to catch those adults. Now when they lay the eggs in there, obviously there's going to be lava in there and in my time when I've been repotting plants and stuff, I've seen fungus gnat lava just chilling around in the roots. In some cases the larvae can damage the roots of very sensitive plants or certain types of plants but I found in the most case they do nothing, they're just there to irritate me and breed. If you've ever been in any plant groups on Facebook they just constantly flooded with people being like how do I get rid of these annoying black flies? What are they? Yes, it's very annoying. They're kind of always knocking around a bit, but ways to interrupt the breeding cycle. So the first option, and this is why they're very easy to get rid of in collections of cacti, because you can let the soil completely dry out. And when the soil's completely dry, they're not interested. It's no good to them. So you can let the soil dry out a bit more in plants where that is possible. You can switch to bottom watering temporarily for a few times, which helps the top few inches of soil to be dry. And then again, it's not suitable. You can also top dress the soil with rocks and stuff that will make it more difficult for them to access the top soil. Some people also use diametaceous. I can never say this word, diametaceous earth and which is this powdery stuff. I actually have some. And this stuff, when they come into contact with it, it just completely dehydrates them and kills them. I let my housemate borrow it uh, for some thing on his plants that worked really well the other day. Some people use this for thrips also, but the thing about this is it doesn't work when it's wet. So as soon as it's been watered over something, you need to put more on afterwards or it won't actually work. I mean, it's pretty much standard that these guys will be flying around at some point. But if it's really, really driving you mad, a product that is very good for them, but it's difficult to get in the UK and it's overpriced in my opinion, but it's mosquito bits. And these work in the same way to kill fungus gnats. And there's also mosquito dunk. Uh, the mosquito bits, you kind of use them similarly to how you use those solid uh, for like slow release fertilizers in soil. But I've seen that after a long time, they can go a bit like fuzzy as if they've gone a little bit moldy. And in the same way that I was talking about using the 3% hydrogen peroxide to water the soil to kill thrip, lava and eggs, that also works for fungus gnats. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. It feels very funny to have spent a very long time talking about insects and arachnids instead of plants today.
I hope that I've given you a helping hand in potentially sorting out pest problem you might be having or one that you might have in the future. Now you know how to deal with it. At the moment, I'm posting long form content on Fridays and shorts whenever I'm able to. So please hit subscribe to be notified when I next make a video. I also post daily on Instagram. There's all kinds of stuff on there. And if you'd be interested in buying some botanical and nature inspired illustrated art prints, then please head over to my website. It's buildyourjungle.com. And I hope you have an amazing day and that you don't have thrips because they suck. Have a great day.